Welcome to another episode of the On the Wars Rebellion channel here. Today from Snowy Fort Davis. It seems I always pick the perfect times for these videos weather-wise. I was sweating like crazy in the summer at the New Mexico side and we're at the kind of moment of a blizzard hitting Texas, West Texas today here at Fort Davis and it's really cold so I'll be very warmly dressed today. What we'll look at very briefly today is the preservation of this fort, the challenges faced by the National Park Service, the organizations local here in Fort Davis in their attempt to preserve this fort for prosperity after 1891 when the U.S. Army abandons this location. After the U.S. military abandons Fort Davis in 1891, the fort fell into ruins. Around 1906, the U.S. government starts to sell off parts of the land that belonged to this reservation, military reservation. And initially the local community is not focused on preserving the fort, but would like to do something with regard to a state park, historic site, um, natural environment park, for the mountains surrounding Fort Davis. By 1920s that focus started to shift and instead of a mountain recreation park, Fort Davis's local booster community is looking at preserving the fort instead. What happens is that the local booster community, which is awkwardly named Mile High Club, is then deciding to reach out try to find a buyer, try to find opportunities to turn this crumbling site into something beautiful again. It is in 1946 that D.A. Simmons, a Houston attorney, purchases Fort Davis with the intent of turning it into something historically um, valuable. He rents out it locally and one of his renters actually creates a little museum space, a um, restaurant, um, but there are some issues and there's a lot of local legends, local lures that start to develop as a result unfortunately and stories start to emerge that the National Park Service once it takes over has to work against. The big change for Fort Davis comes in 1952 when the local community invites the superintendent of Big Band National Park to visit a local meeting to talk about what the steps are to preserve Fort Davis and add it to the National Park Service inventory. He's very, the superintendent of Big Band is very cautious. Um, the National Park Service has already done studies with regard to Fort Davis, its historical integrity and so on. But the decision there is to take it careful, take it slow, um, not give false impressions and hopes. But that starts the ball rolling, the National Park Service becomes more involved and greatly benefiting the entire enterprise is that with Robert Utley, 
There are individuals within the Park Service recognizing that Fort Davis, as a base for an African-American unit, has a huge historic significance. In addition to that, Senator Lynn B. Johnson takes an interest in preserving historic sites within Texas and is making efforts within Congress, pushing the National Park Service to act as well, which leads eventually to the great opportunity in 1960 that the idea is first introduced in Congress to create Fort Davis as a National Historical Park, and then in 1961 it actually becoming a reality and at that stage, a lot of work has to happen. The first superintendent, Michael Becker, when he finally arrives here, is a unique feature. Um, he lives in the eastern part of town. Fort Davis is actually a segregated community with the eastern part more Hispanic in nature. And he goes to the Catholic Church. With the National Park Service in town, federal wage, it changes the entire community. The dynamics within the community change. One of the first local hires that Becker does is to hire a chief of maintenance. And he hires Pablo Bencom to do that, a Hispanic, local Hispanic, which again creates certain animosities within the community that raises fears, concerns among the Anglo settlers in town. On top of that, we're going to get Charles Woodbury from the San Francisco Office for Design and Maintenance down here to help with the rebuilding process of the structures. He is a divorcee, he is living with his girlfriend, he has alcohol problems, all things that in a white Protestant community are looked down upon. There's one story that he is arrested eventually for drunk driving on the sidewalks of Fort Davis and the local sheriff supposedly claims that he is the first white man to ever go to his jail. So there are some issues at the start, but as time goes, um, Fort Davis has become an important tourist attraction for this community and considering it is a snowstorm going on sort of right now, looking around, there's a dozen cars in the parking lot right now. So people are very much coming here, seeing it going on to Big Bend and other places in the region. It has become a destination. One of the challenges that Fort Davis faced from the very start is what you sort of see behind me, what you see behind me there, and that is of course a problem of restoration. A lot of the buildings were falling apart, heavily damaged, and throughout the site you can see the evidence of that restoration work. I'll show some pictures afterwards after this segment to showcase some of that work as well. Most of the initial work was done by the Western Division of Design and Construction out of San Francisco who sent actually individuals out here to help out with this effort. And it's an ongoing process here at Fort Davis to present the site and restore it as it would have been during the high days of Fort Davis in the 1880s. 